Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Tampa Bay History Center and to the third annual Nell Ward Lecture on Cartography. This is one of the most popular lectures uh, that we offer each year. I'm C.J. Roberts, the Frankie Duckwall President and CEO of the Center, and I am so pleased that you all were able to join us for tonight's presentation. Now, as most of you know, we're in the map business in a big way here. Uh, and it is our privilege to serve as the stewards of one of the finest collections of historic maps of Florida in existence. Uh, these maps are used for research, exhibitions, programs, and publications. The, this wonderful collection represents several decades of work by an individual who has actively searched for, researched, purchased, and curated over 5,000 maps. His generosity and that of his late wife, Lee Touchton, in gifting the collection to TBHC has enabled the History Center to create the Touchton Map Library and Florida Center for Cartographic Education, one of the only centers of its kind in the United States and one that we operate in partnership with the University of South Florida. It's a great partnership. We are very grateful to the Touchtons for enabling us to maintain these collections and to share the many stories that, we, that they tell with our community. It is now my pleasure to introduce Tom Touchton, whose passion for maps uh, has led to this tremendous resource and really community treasure. Tom? Thank you, CJ, and welcome to everyone. Before I make a special introduction, I want to add my personal welcome to our guest speaker tonight, Matthew Edney whom I have known for about 25 years, and he is one of the academic giants uh, in the map world or cartographic world. Uh, Matthew has forgotten more about maps than I will ever know. So Matthew, thank you for being here, and I know we all look forward to your, to your talk. Um, the special introduction I want to make is of Nell Ward. Um, some years ago, my, my phone rang late one afternoon, and I saw that it was Nell calling, and I said, hi, Nell, how are you? And she said, Tom, I'm fine. She said, you know, I was a former school teacher, and I'm still interested in education, and I would like to make a gift to the History Center to endow the annual MAP lecture. May I do that? And I said, yes, Nell, you may do that. <laughs> Uh, well, Nell did that, uh, and now, as CJ said, this is our third annual MAP lecture. Uh, we were interrupted for a while by COVID, but like all of us, we we're back trying to get back to normal. Uh, I know you will enjoy the, the, the lecture tonight, but I also know you will enjoy the fact that not only will we enjoy tonight's uh, Nell Ward MAP lecture, but others for years and years to come will enjoy the lecture uh, uh, endowed by Nell. And Nell, would you come up and say just a few words for us? Well, I think CJ and Tom stole my thunder, but it'll be a little repetitious. As my teaching career, having spanned multiple areas of which was so, one of which was social studies, I felt like I would like nothing better than to sponsor this annual lecture in cartography. The deciding factor was Tom Touchton, without whom we would not have had the Tampa Bay History Center. His contributing his extensive map collection along with his wife, Lee, to this institution made my decision to sponsor this lecture series in cartography a no-brainer. My deep appreciation to everyone at the Tampa Bay History Center, in particular Rodney Kite Powell, director of the Touch and Map Collection, and C.J. Roberts, CEO of the History Center, who had a hand in making this wonderful event possible for us to enjoy this evening. Thank you so much. Nell, thank you very much. We are so grateful for your support, and, and more importantly, we're grateful for your friendship. So thank you. 
Uh, now I'd like to turn the program over to someone most of you probably already know, Rodney Kite Powell, who's the director of the Touchton Map Library and Florida Center for Cartographic Education, and he'll introduce our speaker. Rodney. Thank you all, and, and good evening, and welcome once again. Uh, before I get to the important part, which is bringing up Dr. Edney, I do want to say that uh, after the uh, conclusion of the, of the talk, uh, of course, we'll have opportunity for question and answer, and happy to, um, to take care of that for you guys. Uh, we are having this filmed, and it's being broadcast live via Zoom, but also it will be um, part of our or a collection of, of lectures that we have beginning, begun to assemble. And so as you ask questions, I'd like to be able to bring you the microphone. So as much as you want to get that question out, please wait for me to get to you with the microphone so you can say it in the microphone. And uh, for those who are watching this live, uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions as well. Just uh, use the, um, the little chat feature within Zoom and we can ask your question for you. So with that, I will be happy to introduce Dr. Edding. Uh, Matthew Edney is a British-born geographer who thought he would become a land surveyor. But encountering historical geography at the University College of London, where he received his Bachelor of Science with honors in 1983, we can start doing the math and see how old Matthew is, uh, sent him off to study map history with David Woodward at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where Matthew received both his master's and his PhD. He taught cartography and computer, and computer cartography at Sunny Binghamton before moving to the University of Southern Maine in 1995. He is a professor of geography and faculty scholar at the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education. And during his presentation, you will see uh, as a credit line OML, and that is for the Osher Map Library and the Smith Center. In 2007, he was appointed to the first Osher Chair in the History of Cartography at University of Southern Maine. Since 2005, Edney has also directed the History of Cartography Project at the University of Wisconsin. He established the principles for designing the last three volumes of the History of Cartography as interpretive encyclopedias. In addition to keeping the project funded, he edited Cartography in the European Enlightenment, volume four of the series, together with Mary Pedley. Edney's specific interests have expanded from their early beginnings in the history of surveying technologies, practices, and institutional contexts to European state and imperial mapping and he wrote a book on that called Mapping an Empire. And now encompasses the wider practices and performances of map making in Europe after 1600. Since moving to Maine, he has researched and written extensively about colonial cartographies in New England and British America. He is broadly interested in the nature of maps and their history. This work has generated a number of works, including an intellectual biography of Brian Harley, published as a Cartographia monograph in 2005, and Cartography, the Ideal in its History which we have for sale here at the, at the bookstore. He is currently working on the related works, the map, concepts, and histories, and, and then mapping, processes, and history. His conceptual work, together with an interest in the technologies of map making, first stimulated by Woodward, has led him to offer a course at the Rare Book School on the material foundations of map history, 1450 to 1900. His presentation today brings together that broad topic with the interpretive work he does for the Osher Map Library. So please welcome, or allow me to introduce Matthew Edney. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm first of all going to apologize. I'm coming off a cold. My head is a bit weird, and so I might need to down more than just this. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> now I start coughing. You know why. <coughs> okay. Um, so, to begin, my deepest thanks to Tom and for the invitation to Rodney for doing all the arrangements and especially to Nell for endowing this lecture series. There's nothing more important than good public lectures and map history to get people engaged in all sorts of wonderful topics. Um, as Ruddy mentioned, I spend most of my life at the Ocean Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education, which is a wonderful place in Portland, Maine. Um, pay special attention to the exhibit gallery, and in the top right corner, the uh, digital studio where we have a couple of people who do incredible work making digital images of our maps. Secondly, uh, I 
run the History of Cartography project for my sins. And um, this is a big multi-volume series, six volumes in 12 separate bindings. Is a really complex publication history. The last one to come out is volume five, which is currently in preparation. And we are on target for a December 27, maybe earlier publication for volume five. The last three volumes are each one million words. So the quickest way to go insane is to try to copy edit one of these, these puppies, which is why I don't do it. Um, I do have a great staff, and if anybody has any money that they want to give to me for the project that is not already committed to this wonderful institution, please talk to me. <laughs> One of the things I've been able to do um, is I persuaded the press to put the volumes online for free public access. Uh, through last December, uh, sorry, last, through, through last June, we had over 4.4 million hits on the published volumes, volume four went online on the 5th of July. So I'm waiting to see what the December hits are gonna be with volume four going. For free, public access, download, do what you want with them. And look, volume four. And volume five will go online within three years of print and ebook publication. Okay, enough of the puffery. So this talk begins with uh, a commitment I made at OSHA to do another exhibit. We've done, I've done lots of exhibits there, and talking to the, the, the executive director, we decided we'd do the show on the process called chromolithography. Um, it gets confusing because any lithographic printing press system that has color has been called chromolithography, but there's actually a very particular technique I'll get back to about this. So, and it's gonna open probably end of the, at the end of this month. Um, I've gotta write the labels yet, but that's another story. Um, so if I'm gonna talk about chromolithography, then I also need to talk a bit about um, lithography. And the best way to understand the nature of lithography is to talk a bit about the preceding and competing technologies, uh, woodblock, copper, plate, and some other things. And if I'm doing that, then I might as well do the whole lecture on um, starting with brief comments about color and mapping and then going all the way through to a conclusion. And the best thing about this is that the in, in organizing this, this uh, this exhibition, um, has actually led to a really, for me personally, quite interesting uh, illuminating insight about the way that chromolithography has been used in very particular ways to image the spectacular in the 19th century. And so the exhibit is gonna be called A Pageant of Spectacles, colon, chromolithography in America. And we'll have an online version of it soon enough. So enough of the puffery, and let's get going through the series. So color is a really important element in cartography and always has been. Here, for example, is the title page to the first, what's often called the first modern atlas, Abraham Ortelius's De Artem Orbis Terrarum from 1570. Um, and here is the same title page with extra added color. Um, applied by hand. Without the color, you can really get a sense of the quality of the engraving and the skill of the engraver. But with the color, you start to get further dimensions, which is why my talk is adding further dimensions. Color adds dimension. It might just be to make the design pop. It might be to add realism. And it might be to convey actual data. I don't have actual geological maps in this talk, but geological maps are really obvious kind of map in which color is used to have very specific meanings. Um, now color is integral to making maps by hand, manuscript mapping. Here's a title page to a manuscript atlas of 
the uh, electorate of Saxony made about 1735-1740, um, my guy called Zerner, and in the top corner you can see this detail of one of Zerner's draftsmen drawing a map of one of the counties of Saxony, and you can see quite clearly that he's using different colors for different things. Color is part and parcel of the manuscript process. But for printed maps, and the first printed map in the European tradition is 1472, color is generally, right up through 1900, added by hand. So this is one of Tom's maps. And if you look very carefully uh, at this detail area, you can see with the little arrows, little blotches where the watercolor has gone outside the line. Uh, watercolor tends to travel a bit and so it can often bleed beyond the line that's supposed to be containing it. And these telltale little blobs of brush strokes and stuff are the, the marker for hand-applied watercolor. Watercolor is applied extensively because for most of the 18th, 19th centuries and earlier, it's cheap to do it. Color is applied as a, uh, as a piecework process in which uh, normally young women, uh, sometimes younger boys, but normally women, girls and women, are employed for a few pennies per map to color in various ways. In the 19th century, as the, these images suggest, is almost a, a mini industry in its own right. Um, just a, as, an enjoy, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as a job to, um, to keep one's in, in well, keep one, keep one alive. Um, but it's very cheap. And in fact, one of the things the British did in India, going back to my dissertation work, is they hired orphans from orphanages to do the coloring because they're really cheap. Um, so, the thing is, one of the other reasons, the, the, the counter reason, you know, we can hand color maps with watercolor because it's really cheap to employ um, underemployed women this way. But conversely, it's difficult to print color because it's often hard to make quite sure the color actually lines up properly. So again, here's another map from the Touchton Collection. And if we look just in this little area, we can see how the, these color boundaries should actually agree with the printed black boundary of each county. Um, this is a problem called registration and the plates, whoops, there we go. Too, too remote, getting them confused. Um, so the, the, the technical term is that these colors are not in register. So this is a common problem. If you're printing in color, every color is going to be a different plate, one plate per color. And when you print them, they've got to align properly. But it's actually really, really quite hard to do that. Thus, the extensive watercolor. Now, when maps started to be printed back in the 15th century, the first technique to do so was using wood. Um, and then the second was copper. And each of these really demonstrate the, the problem with registration, the problem with trying to get different plates to print close up and aligned in the correct way. So woodcut is technically called a relief printing technique in which you have a, a block of wood, a plank of wood, and you cut away what you do not want to print. So everything is left normally sitting up high is then going to get the ink and that's what going to, um, when you press the paper down, that is the surface ink that's going to be transferred to the paper. It's just like a potato print. <laughs> Here's a couple of uh, contemporary images of uh, a rather drunken press man on the, on the left. Um, there's a routine problem with printers being drunk um, in the early modern period. Uh, and on the right, you've got a character who's using these balls to ink 
uh, ink up the, the image before being printed. Woodblock and relief printing generally requires a very low pressure press, just a bit of pressure, just to force the paper down to pick up the ink. Um, it's a simple screw. You don't screw it all the way around. It's just a single pull is enough to, to drop the, the, the press down onto the uh, paper to press it against the bed of the press. Here's an example woodcut. I'll come to a detail in a moment. This is from the Plantain Miradis uh, House in Antwerp. If you ever go to Antwerp, you've got to go to this museum. It is a printing nerd's absolute dream. Um, here's a detail. And you can see all the areas that have been gouged out uh, because they are not going to be printed. One of the things, though, you have to bear in mind when you're dealing with printing is that everything on the printing plate has to be mirrored. It has to be inverse. So the lettering in the top left of the detail, Frisia Paz, reads backwards so that when it's printed, the print will be right reading. So one of the terms I'll keep bouncing back and forth is wrong reading and right reading. And here, for example, um, no, oh, no. Uh, again, showing the Frisia Paz text. On the right is the wood block, wrong reading, and on the left is the final print, which is right reading. And in case you're wondering, the reason there's a hole in the wood block is that, that way you could fit uh, regular bits of foundry type, regular letters, into the hole to have a different title. So you can change the title really easily without having to basically cut a hole in the wood block, put a new chunk of wood in and recut it um, to make the change. Because wood block is, lo is low pressure and the ink just sits on top of the block, you can have area ink. You can have a large blob of black. You can have a thin lines of black and everything in between. And this means that you can, in fact, do color printing. First printed color maps, 1513 map of what is now Lorraine in France. The south is at the top. Um, is printed in red, black, and green. Uh, is at the back of <clears throat> Martin Valsey Muller's 1513 edition, Ptolemy's Geography. And every single impression of this map is different because every single time they printed it, the different plates, different wood blocks didn't quite match up. And so, sorry, I keep bopping this. So the, um, the images are all subtly different. And then uh, on the top right one, somebody started adding yellow watercolor as well. So you've got three colors printed and then some more watercolor added just for the hay. Now copper, is a much more, is a, is a different process. It's called an intaglio or an engraved process where you have a copper plate and you actually run a knife into the copper to dig out lines and the lines are going to hold the ink. So the paper was going to sit on top of the ink, on top of the plate, is going to be driven through a very high pressure rolling press and the paper is going to be forced down into the little grooves that are cut into the copper plate to, to pick up the ink that's there. There are the changes to this. The, the plate is generally hot. It's heated in this process while it's being inked, and the surface ink is being cleaned off so that the lines are just a bit wider, and the paper is, a, is wet, is wet just a bit, so that it's a bit puffy, so that it will go down into the grooves to pick up the ink. Um, so you end up with the ink in the grooves within the copper, so that when it is printed, it's the grooves ink that pick, is picked up by the paper. And here's an example of a letterpress or an Italia rolling press not letter press, entire rolling press. And you can see the guy at the left who is somehow hauling on one bar 
as he's pushing down with his foot on the other bar. And if you're a klutz like me, you cannot do this. Um, there is video of me trying to do it, and it is sorely embarrassing, uh, for me at least. Um, the students were loving it. But anyway, um, and you can see on the bed of the press a stack of what looks like paper is a mix of felt and some other paper, all of which is um, protecting the sheet that's going to receive the ink from the copper plate that's under that stack. And in fact, it's so high pressure that copper plate presses, literally the, the paper is forced over the edges of the copper plate and is permanently deformed. And it leaves what's called the plate mark. And so you find one of the, one of the telltales for, for copper printing is that existence of a plate mark, which you can feel, you know, could be 400 years later, and that plate mark is still very much there. It's part of the high pressureness of the press. This has a couple of issues. One is you can't print area color because you're such high press. If you've got anything like a mass of color sitting on the cover plate, it's going to go spurting everywhere and it's not going to be good. And secondly, it's very actually hard to get two, the same piece of paper through a rolling press twice and to match up because each time it's going through the press, it's being distorted in different ways. So it just doesn't quite match up. So it's actually really hard to print color through copper, but not impossible. And there were some experiments to do so. So a French chart maker called Jacques Nicolas Balin, working for the French government, the naval, uh, sort of onshore naval headquarters, the Depot de la Marine, um, produced all these charts. And if you look, it's covered in all these lines, uh, wind lines that go everywhere, sort of required for mid-18th century navigation. And really fiddly to have to keep re-engraving, especially if you start making, have to make changes to the copper plate, you've got to redo these lines. So he experimented with um, printing the, the wind lines on a separate plate and in a color. So this is in red. Um, we actually have one where he's printed the wind lines in green, and then he added green watercolor as well to the coasts, just for the hay. <laughs> this is very hard to do, and, the way, and he can get the registration by actually having pins set into the bed of the press, very, very narrow, and you can see where that red line, horizontal line, ends. That's a pinhole where the copper plate has been sort of set on to try to hold it in place as it's going through this very high pressure press. So there are a few of these color printing attempts, but very few. This changes in the 19th century when mass education, mass industrialization, mass literacy, government activity just makes the demand for maps just proliferate. Um, and very early on, there is, it becomes quite apparent that a copper plate isn't good enough to meet a demand. You can run a copper plate through a printing press a thousand times, 1,500 times at most, before you've got to start re-engraving it and it just wears out. But what if you want to do a print run of, of 10,000 or 100,000 copies of a map to go into a book? because by the 1830s, 1840s, you're getting print runs for books of 100,000 or more, some books. Um, how do you get maps? And also, how do you get color maps at the same time to print that number of copies? Well, one way is to use existing techniques and to play with it a bit. So this is a, a, a Boston dealer, a dealer newspaper publisher who uses a combination of regular uh, type um, that you would use for printing newspaper, plus special type for straight lines for roads, and then a couple of layers of uh, blue and green. The green has faded to a brown um, for color. So he's got woodblock area color, and he's got some other color. And he's, he's having a fun time. And as far as I can tell, nobody else does anything like this. It's just this one guy experimenting. And in France, 1823 or so, 
a company called the Fermat de Do. Um, again, experiments with watercolor, with, with wood blocks for doing several colors uh, of one map. And what I like about this is across the bottom, you actually have an explanation of the sequence in which the colors are done. The company is basically saying, hey, look, we can print color. We can print your map in color. Pay us. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it for you. Um, and it goes through different kinds, and you end up with this result. There are other attempts that are very similar. My favorite attempts are a guy, by, a guy called George Baxter, who in the 1840s worked trying to get in print the look of lantern slides. Lantern slides are these color plates that are hand-painted and then projected with artificial light that's now available uh, onto a screen, and it becomes this this huge fad in the 30s and 40s of, um, wow, we got projected images. Not, we don't have to go and look at photo, uh, paintings. We can actually project them and talk about them at the same time. And he uses a whole series of uh, woodblock and copper plate and some zinc plates to try to layer um, his colors so you end up with very complex imagery. This is from... Uh, the work of a guy called Isaac Frost, who's a Muggletonian, um, who's a weird Protestant sect that believe the world is the right size, but the sun is literally as far away as it looks, and it zips around the earth very quickly. And this is kind of show that. And there's some other attempts in, in, through the early 19th century, but none of these really take off. Bax's technique is just too expensive, and so... And it just falls, falls apart. And this leads to, um, by the 1830s, 1840s, a dramatic acceptance and use of a new technique called lithography, which literally means writing on stone. Lithography is different from wood, which is relief, and is different from copper, which is intaglio, because lithography is a planar process. Everything, everything happens on the top of big, thick, very, very smoothly polished blocks of stone, particularly uh, kinds of limestone from a, from a quarry in Solnhofen in Bavaria that is remarkably consistent. The, the particles in the limestone are perfectly spherical, and they're all almost exactly the same size. It's an amazing rock. They found other quarries where you can get equally good stone later, but Solnhofen was the, was the first. So why is this a process? Lithography works by chemistry. This guy, Alois Senefelder, in the 1790s, the story is, I still haven't figured out if this is true or not, but it's a great story, that he wanted to have his own musical compositions published. And to print music right up through this period, you would basically take a copper plate and you have to have all this, the staffs engraved and each individual note are going to be hand engraved. And it's tedious and expensive and it's all sorts of errors you've got to work with. And he wanted a cheap, easy system because uh, nobody was paying to have his music engraved <laughs> in an expensive way. And so he came up with this way of taking these large chunks of rock and drawing with a greasy pen on the surface directly. And the greasy pen will hold ink. So you grease up the lines that you want to print. You cover the whole plate in ink. And then you wipe away with water the excess ink. And where the ink isn't attached to the greasy bits, it wipes off. So you're left with ink sitting on greasy bits, which are stuck to the, the stone. So you can then use a relatively low pressure uh, press to print the ink onto, onto paper. So we go uh, again through the process, and the, you're left with um, the ink on the plane surface that gets transferred to the paper. And here's an example. And you can see just how thick this uh, hunk of limestone is. I mean, we're talking a good four or five inches. 
Um, lithographic stones are really heavy. Um, I do not recommend lifting them unless you're a you know, bodybuilder. Um, and you can see how the, the design is lying on the stone and then that keeps the ink and so that can then transfer to paper in the press. Pretty quickly, Senefelder figured out uh, a transfer method. Chemically treated paper, you draw right reading on the paper, take that when, you, when your design is done, press that down on the lithographic stone, rub it from behind and it transfers the greasy substance to the surface of the stone, which you can then ink and print. Or you can take a lithographic stone, print it, and when the ink is still wet, you can transfer that ink to another lithographic stone. Lithography, it's, it's just chemistry. And you can transfer entire images or little bits of images back and forth from lithographic transfer paper to lithographic stones, back and forth, um, almost ad infinitum. So with lithography, it actually becomes relatively easy to print in color because you, have, you, you take what's called the key. I'll give you an example of this in a few minutes. You take the key design, which is just the outline of your, your, your larger design, could be a map, could be a work of art, and you transfer that to each of your printing plates, and you use the key design to figure out where you're gonna put which color, and if you do the properly, they will all match up nicely, neatly in register, and you'll have a beautiful, beautiful image. So, <clears throat> to give you an idea about the ways in which you can transfer, this wonderful thing called the Cottage Ornament, 1858. It's, what, four feet by five and a half feet in size. It's big. And when you look at the details, <clears throat> all of those individual elements are all transferred from somewhere else. It's 19th century clip art. And they just made these bigger, and some of these war maps are huge. Um, each of the little coins, the roundels, each of the two hemispheres, the decoration around the hemispheres, the figures around the, the portraits of world rulers, they're all drawn on transfer paper and then copied onto and then pressed down onto the litho stone for printing. And then the coloring is all hand applied watercolor because to do so it is cheap. There are a lot of lithographs that are printed just monochrome, just black on paper, because it's pretty cheap. You don't have to engrave a copper plate, um, which takes time and energy. Um, and so if you're doing a relatively small run of images, you can print them with lithography, and you're not gonna have a huge upfront capital cost. So litho gets quite widely used. One of the things it gets used for in the late 19th century <clears throat> are these incredible bird's eye views. These things are made for every town in America, from Lubeck in the far northeast corner of Maine. I doubt if any of you have heard of Lubeck, because it's a teeny, teeny, teeny town, but there are bird's eye views of Lubeck and its herring fisheries, all the way to San Diego in California, and in size from teeny little Lubeck all the way up to New York City. There are thousands of these images produced. And this one, <clears throat> by a German artist called Ruger, published in Madison in 1877, is just black on white. And in the detail, the color that you see is just the paper, the paper tone as it's aged over time. But you can take this image when it's freshly printed, put that onto another stone, and then use it as the basis for coloring certain parts of the lithographic stone. So this is what's called tinted, tinted lithography, where you have um, mostly a black and white image, but just a few bits here, the, the river, 
Um, and some of the streets look like they've been pinky. And I've just got to say, my in-laws live over about there. Um, <clears throat> alas, I don't have one in Freeport. Um, wasn't big enough then. Anyway, so this is one way of doing it. And the, the, the registration is very, very good. I haven't seen a tinted lithograph with poor registration because it's very easy to transfer the base image, apply the greasy bit where you want the blue to go, wipe away the rest, and voila, you can print the blue very easily. And similarly, you can print maps with discrete areas of color. Here's another one from Tom's collection. I like to call this discrete color lithography. Because again, you put the key map down on the stone, and you decide that's going to be green, put the key map on another stone, shade in the areas that are going to be yellow, let's say, and another one that's where it's going to be black, and you can print very straightforwardly. But occasionally, if you look really carefully like here, you can see bits where the colors don't quite match, where the lithographer hasn't quite prepared the stones properly enough so the colors don't quite match. They might overlap or they might have a little gap, like here. And then you've got the feds who want to do something completely different. When the US Geological Survey starts doing um, topographic mapping in the 1880s, they follow the European standard for how you do detailed ter territorial mapping by engraving copper. Um, but it the copper can't give you a huge number of impressions before it starts to wear and, and the impression degrades in quality. So what the federal government did, they engraved three copper plates for every map, one for blue, one for brown, and one for black. So water in blue. But you can't print area in color in copper. So all the, uh, the blue is just series of lines closely spaced to say, this is blue. Imagine it's a blue wash. It's not, but we can't, we can't do it. And then brown for contours and black for all the cultural features, names, roads, buildings, and so on. So what they would then do is print one of, each one of the stones, uh, each one of the copper plates, sorry, and then transfer that image to a lithographic stone, and then they could print the colors from the three lithographic stones from the three copper plates and produce any number of prints that they wanted. So we've got four completely different techniques of working with maps and lithography to make color. And then we get to the glorious chromolithography. And so here's, uh, I'll come back to the, what this is in a few minutes, this image. So chromolithography works by building up an image from 10, 20 layers of different colors. It works by taking your, your key design. In this case, this is not a map, um, clearly. Uh, but you, you take this image and you know, chemically transfer it to each of your printing blocks. In this case, it's going to have 22 colors. And if the key design is exactly the right size for the block, and it's very easy to get the blocks the same size, your registration is going to work perfectly. And then you start printing. So you have the first color, in this case, almost a gold. And then you get a second color, and in this case, a yellow and you print them on top of each other, and you end up with something like gold with a few bits of yellow highlighted. And you keep on going. Here's the next four uh, layers. So plate six is not much. It's just a wee bit of green, just a bit of highlight. And together, the first six plates give you a lot more complex. And you keep them going. Again, plate nine is just a bit of filigree that's going to be modifying some of the, the, this extra part of plate eight. And that gives you 10 colors all printed together. Um, and there's that little filigree playing around in that area. 
And you can just keep on going. Here are plates 1 through 14, 1 through 18, and then finally, the final image with 22 different layers of color all printed on top of each other. Now, a lot of this technique is used for, frankly, horrible imagery. Uh, mawkish, sentimental. Um, it's one of the reasons chromolithography is called the democratic art, because it sort of pushed full color imagery out to everybody in, a, in, in the United States, um, and in Europe for that matter. In general usage, you get a lot of this. But in map usage, it's really fun. One of the first applications of chromolithography was to reproduce this map. It's a 16th century map by a French uh, map maker called Vallard. It's the original's in manuscript, and the owner was trying to basically sell off the manuscript. Um, and he had this chromo print done to try to drum up interest, especially by the British Museum, which did not buy the image. Uh, the atlas now is in the Huntington Library. But if you go to a detail, you can start to see how very precise levels of different kinds of color. We've got pinky bits for the, uh, for the flesh tone on the figures. We've got different kinds of green and a bit of blue uh, for the grass and the foliage. We've got red for this place name and that place name. Um, and you can start to see how the different colors are being overprinted. So this is not an attempt to draw a map with nice lines saying roads and coastlines, but rather is an attempt to try to draw a picture, to try to recreate the look of manuscripts and painted oils and, and the like. So I like to think that for mapping purposes, chromolithography gets used for visualizations in part. And there's nothing more clear than the work of Levi Yagi in Chicago, who's an educational publisher who produces a whole series of big picture books for teaching medicine and teaching history and geography. And his 1887 um, geography starts with his wonderful um, globe. It's about this wide, and they're actually they're stored in a box. Um, and the box has a topographical map of the US and paper mache at one end. It's an amazing piece. Um, now, even the regional maps that are in here for teaching purposes are actually printed from Chroma. Um, they don't look it, but there's the same printing process. But it really becomes apparent in the final work of the 1887 book, this incredible uh, zonal map that basically lays out the entire philosophy of imperialism and the right of, the right, R-I-G-H-T, of uh, Westerners to govern the world. I mean, this is everything, the whole ideology of 19th century empire is in here. The uh, racialization of peoples into distinct groups, um, the vive zones where you've got the frigid at the poles, the too temperate, and the torrid zone around the equator, which is too hot for Westerners. So when we look in the detail image, you can see that the, there are no Westerners in the torrid zone. Um, they're actually acting in the two temperates, um, leaving the torrid zone for the locals, who are going to be ruled indirectly through a colonial system. This is grounded in 19th century ideas of scientific racism, and it's incredibly racist and sexist and imperialistic, and is one of the best things to teach with. I can go on for a whole, whole class just on this image. It's so much, it's so much disturbing fun, I must admit. Yagi continued uh, his 1895 geographical portfolio. It's a whole host, it's much smaller has a whole host of chromolithos, including a new version of the world map, um, now showing distribution of fauna and flora, as well as a distribution of races, plus the heat. So you can see in red, the torrid zone, 
um, where whites go native, um, which is why you know, Europeans in Asia have to start wearing pith helmets to protect them from the sun and all this kind of mythology around being a white man in the tropics. Anyway. Um, but also, he has individual views now to one of the torrid zone, one of the, one of the frigid zones, and one of the temperate zones to suggest the nature of um, civilization and, you know, with a nice, uh, almost like a city upon a hill, Congress. Um, it's getting into the Puritan uh, settlers there. Anyway, he's got wonderful cross-sections of geology uh, trying to visualize what it's like under the earth. We can't see this, but we're sort of interpolating it. Uh, trying to visualize these places, just like the other images of visualizing the world in, in a way that you don't normally see. And this kind of practice is picked up by others. Etienne Trouvelo, who was a, a French astronomer who moved um, to Boston area, and he worked at Harvard, and these things are great. He has these, these times when he's saying, this is a partial eclipse observed on this day. Here is a planet Mars, not only observed on this day, but at a particular time, five minutes before midnight, um, when in fact these images are actually composites from multiple observations he made over time that he's then transferred to a litho stone so he can do this complex chromolithography to try to give a sense to the viewer of the image what he saw through the telescope when he's looking at the moon or looking at Mars and so on. Here's a whole album of these things. And they're just wonderful visualizations of other places. And then you start to get the other use of chromolithography in a, in a mappy kind of way. And that's to depict realistic views from above. Bird's eye views um, or what have you. So here is John Bashman's uh, panorama of the, of the East Coast of the Seat of War from 1861. There's a, another sheet that goes off this way, but it doesn't fit the three that are joined here. Um, here's a detail of the Florida sheet at the far left. You know, you've got the Union blockading Pensacola and all sorts of other things going on. Um, using chroma, the, the layering of greens and yellows and blues and black and a bit of red to try to give the impression of this is what you would see if you could go up in a balloon and look down. Not that anybody could go up that high in a balloon and survive at that point. Um, no artificial oxygen, that kind of stuff. You find the same technique being used for the battles, Gettysburg in particular, but we have chromos of some of the, the hospitals and prisons that the Union um, set up in the North. Um, we have some other battles as well. Um, and John Batchelder also does a lot of the bird's eye views later on after the Civil War. So these are high altitude views that are trying to look realistic, and they're using this complex coloring uh, and layering of colors to try to create that sense of realism. Much later, there's another spate of use of chromolithography, for, often for touristic purposes. So this is a map of the area around Chattanooga showing the trolley lines going to the battlefields from the Civil War. Um, trying to promote tourism. In fact, the right-hand panel is an a example one-day itinerary. You know, take these trolleys to go to these different parts of Civil War battlefields. And in fact, we can find, certainly for New England, a large number of these sort of, again, these high-altitude regional imagery, as if it's a portrait from above, but then with Red lines added, in this case, for a ferry going around Cape Cod. You have them for trolley car networks. Uh, again, trying to visualize the, the landscape in a way that maps just themselves just don't really do. 
and again for the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, um, this incredible chromo of bird's eye view of Chicago with the fairgrounds in the front, um, just stunning. Um, if you can get up to Maine some point in before June when the show's going to come down, you've got to see this exhibit. It is going to be amazing. Normally we have like 40 images in an exhibit. I've got 100 items in this show because we're going to hang it like a 19th century gallery with all the walls covered in fun chromos. And there are some more chromo lithographies. Uh, Arbuckle's Coffee produced little slips um, about this size with information. There's a, uh, they did a state atlas, atlas of the US states. They did a world atlas this way. And they put the cars individually into their packs of coffee as a collectible to get you to buy more coffee, just like cigarette trading cards. Um, and then, no, I was just saying to Tom earlier, uh, here's Florida in 1889, population just shy of 270,000. Thank Rodney, sorry. And now it's, I don't know what the state of, Maine, state of Florida's population is, but it's... 20 million? 22 million. 22 million. Okay, so say times nine. <laughs> no. Times 19. <laughs> times bigger. His main population, 650,000 is now like 1.2 million. It's smaller than Hillsborough <laughs> County. Um, we haven't grown, you guys have. But anyway, we have these wonderful scenes of tip of, no, stereotyping Florida, stereotyping Maine and all the other US states. Board games, the covers to board games are often chromos. And then in this case, the, the board game, the board itself is also printed in from Chromo to get this vibrant look. And trade cards. Um, if you really wanted to go to Buffalo, you can get all these Michigan Central Great Western trade cards of the same bridge from different perspectives. Um, I've got a, a, a set of about 25 to 30 of these things going to go in one large wall case. So, so to wrap up, because I've spoken for too long, um, I began this project just trying to understand the primary techniques for color map printing, especially chromolithography, in the 19th century. And I really didn't expect to see the, the patterns of usage of these different technologies so clearly expressed as I did. You have watercolor hand-applied watercolor for the great majority of 19th century maps that are colored. Uh, it's cheap, it's quick, relatively straightforward. You find them in atlas maps, both big world atlases produced in New York or local atlases of land ownership. Um, lots and lots and lots of hand-colored work. And then you have those tinted lithos primarily a black image, um, but with just a few areas colored in, one or two, um, showing a different color, just for a bit of highlight, just to pop the, flow, pop the water or the, or the streets. Discrete color mapping, color printing, gets used extensively as you go through the 19th century. By about 1890, it's becoming the way of, of Print, pardon me, printing color generally for maps, and is going to segue in the 20th century to more modern techniques, which I won't get into. You've got the US Geological Survey, which kept using its copper plates right up through the Second World War, transferring them, modifying the plate, transferring the images to litho for printing in three colors. It gets even more confusing because then they start correct, creating further colors, blue for woodlands and red for highways, just on lithographic stones. So that it gets quite a complex printing history. And finally, we've got chromolithography. This incredibly precise printing technique that gets used for mapping purposes only for sort of the big 
rather imprecise views of the world. There are no maps in, made by criminal lithography that I've been able to find that show very precise boundaries or roads or buildings. They're all about high altitude views. They're about capturing the spectacular in various ways. So I just, I just love chroma. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>